Muslim congressional candidate Rashida Tlaib, a Democrat from Michigan, celebrated her recent primary victory with several anti-Israel tweets, including one that read, My roots as a Palestinian American are strong and important. The truth about those roots, however, could surprise even Tlaib, as before the 1960s, there were no Palestinian people. As I show in my new book, The History of Jihad from Muhammad to ISIS, the Palestinians were invented as a propaganda weapon against Israel. In 1948, the nascent state of Israel defeated forces from Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Transjordan, Lebanon, Saudi Arabia, and Yemen that had been determined to destroy it utterly. The jihad against it continued, but it held firm, defeating Egypt, Iraq, Syria, Jordan, and Lebanon again in the Six-Day War in 1967, and Egypt and Syria yet again in the 1973 Yom Kippur War. In winning these victories against enormous odds, Israel won the admiration of the free world, leading to the largest scale and most audacious application in Islamic history of Muhammad's dictum, war is deceit. In order to destroy the impression of the tiny Jewish state facing enormous Muslim Arab foes and prevailing, the Soviet KGB, the Soviet Committee for State Security, developed the fiction of an even smaller people, the Palestinians, menaced by a well-oiled and ruthless Israeli war machine. In AD 134, the Romans had expelled the Jews from Judea after the Bar Kokhba revolt and renamed the region Palestine. The Romans plucked this name from the Bible. It was the name of the Israelites' ancient enemies, the Philistines. But never did the term Palestinian refer to anything but a region, not to a people or an ethnicity. In the 1960s, however, the KGB and the nephew of the Mufti of Jerusalem, Haj Amin al-Husseini, who collaborated with the Nazis during World War II, Yasser Arafat, created both these allegedly oppressed people and the instrument of their freedom, the Palestine Liberation Organization, or PLO. Ion Mihai Pasepa, who had served as acting chief of Cold War-era communist Romania's spy service, later revealed what happened. He said, the PLO was dreamt up by the KGB, which had a penchant for liberation organizations. There was the National Liberation Army of Bolivia, created by the KGB in 1964 with help from Ernesto Che Guevara. The KGB also created the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine, which carried out numerous bombing attacks. In 1964, the first PLO Council, consisting of 422 Palestinian representatives, hand-picked by the KGB, approved the Palestinian National Charter, a document that had been drafted in Moscow. The Palestinian National Covenant and the Palestinian Constitution were also born in Moscow, with the help of Ahmed Shukairi, a KGB influence agent who became the first PLO chairman. For Arafat to head the PLO, he had to be a Palestinian himself. Pasepa explained, Arafat was an Egyptian bourgeois, turned into a devoted Marxist by KGB foreign intelligence. The KGB had trained him at its Balashika Special Operations School east of Moscow, and in the mid-1960s decided to groom him as the future PLO leader. First, the KGB destroyed the official records of Arafat's birth in Cairo and replaced them with fictitious documents saying that he had been born in Jerusalem and was therefore a Palestinian by birth. Arafat may have been a Marxist, at least at first, but he and his Soviet handlers made copious use of Islamic anti-Semitism. KGB chief Yuri Andropov noted, the Islamic world was a waiting petri dish in which we could nurture a virulent strain of America hatred grown from the bacterium of Marxist-Leninist thought. Islamic anti-Semitism ran deep. We had only to keep repeating our themes that the United States and Israel were fascist, imperial Zionist countries bankrolled by rich Jews. Islam was obsessed with preventing the infidels occupation of its territory and it would be highly receptive to our characterization of the US Congress as a rapacious Zionist body aiming to turn the world into a Jewish fiefdom. PLO executive committee member Zahir Mussein explained the strategy more fully in a 1977 interview with the Dutch newspaper Truo the Palestinian people, he said, does not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only a means for continuing our struggle against the state of Israel, for our Arab unity. In reality today, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. 
Only for political and tactical reasons do we speak today about the existence of a Palestinian people, since Arab national interests demand that we posit the existence of a distinct Palestinian people to oppose Zionism. For tactical reasons, Jordan, which is a sovereign state with defined borders, cannot raise claims to Haifa and Yaffa, while as a Palestinian, I can undoubtedly demand Haifa, Yaffa, Beersheba, and Jerusalem. However, the moment we proclaim our right to all of Palestine, we will not wait even a minute to unite Palestine and Jordan. Once the people had been created, their desire for peace could be easily fabricated as well. Romanian dictator Nicolae Ceausescu tutored Arafat in how to play the West like a fiddle. Pasepa recounted, In March 1978, I secretly brought Arafat to Bucharest for final instructions on how to behave in Washington. You simply have to keep on pretending that you'll break with terrorism and that you'll recognize Israel. Over and over and over, Ceausescu told Arafat. Ceausescu was euphoric over the prospect that both Arafat and he might be able to snag a Nobel Peace Prize with their fake displays of the olive branch. Ceausescu failed to get his Nobel Peace Prize, but in 1994 Arafat got his, all because he continued to play the role that had been given him to perfection. He had transformed his terrorist PLO into a government in exile, the Palestinian Authority, always pretending to call a halt to Palestinian terrorism while letting it continue unabated. Two years after signing the Oslo Accords, the number of Israelis killed by Palestinian terrorists had risen by 73%. This strategy continued to work beautifully through U.S. brokered peace process after peace process from the 1978 Camp David Accords into the presidency of Barack Obama and beyond, with no end in sight. Western authorities never seemed to ponder why so many attempts to achieve a negotiated peace between Israel and the Palestinians, whose historical existence everybody by now takes for granted, have all failed. The answer, of course, lies in the Islamic doctrine of jihad. Drive them out from where they drove you out is a command that contains no mitigation and accepts none. I'm Robert Spencer, a Shulman Fellow for the David Horowitz Freedom Center and Director of Jihad Watch. This video has been brought to you by the Center for Security Policy.